Hello everyone and welcome to the Wild Side. That was Tift Merritt with Heart Run Wild. And this week on the show, because we are now within the holiday season, and some of you might be looking into getting some Christmas presents for people, I'm going to be doing the same thing I did last year around this time, which is to read some excerpts from science and nature books that I think are particularly interesting and worth buying as presents for your family and friends. And the first one on my list is by M. Cat Anderson, and it's called Tending the Wild. And this is a book that I read um, last year in preparation for going on the geography field trip to California along with the University of Exeter students. And this focuses on certain tribes and places that are specific to North America, but actually has themes that are much more broad than just that one specific place and those specific people. And in fact, it's applicable all around the world, and that's why it's really interesting, is it's something that kind of, um, is, it's a universal thing, a global thing, that I think we all can kind of begin to see around us. And it joins history with nature, which is another thing that I think is interesting, is that it's not just within one realm, it kind of straddles two different fields. So the following uh, excerpt that I'm going to start with is from the introductory chapter of the book. Through 12,000 or more years of existence in what is now California, humans knit themselves to nature through their vast knowledge base and practical experience. In the process, they maintained, enhanced, and in part created a fertility that was eventually to be exploited by European and Asian farmers, ranchers, and entrepreneurs who imagined themselves to have built civilization out of an unpeopled wilderness. The concept of California as unspoiled, raw, uninhabited nature, as wilderness, erased the indigenous cultures and their histories from the land and dispossessed them of their enduring legacy of tremendous biological wealth. As the environmental historian William Cronin notes, the removal of Indians to create an uninhabited wilderness, quote unquote, uninhabited as never before in the human history of the place, reminds us just how invented, just how constructed, the American wilderness really is. John Muir, celebrated environmentalist and founder of the Sierra Club, was an early proponent of the view that the California landscape was a pristine wilderness before the arrival of Europeans. Staring in awe at the lengthy vistas of his beloved Yosemite Valley, or the extensive beds of golden and purple flowers in the Central Valley, Muir was eyeing what were really the fertile seed, bulb, and greens gathering grounds of the Miwok and Yokuts Indians, kept open and productive by centuries of carefully planned indigenous burning, harvesting, and seed scattering. Of course, there were some places that had little or no intervention from native peoples, and these would qualify as true wilderness under the modern definition. The subalpine forests, the drier desert regions of Southern California, the lower salt marsh areas, the beach and dune communities, and the alkali flats and serpentine balls with widely spaced plants do not burn readily nor do they support large numbers of economically useful plants. In addition, there were areas that were off limits to burning because their favored plants were not fire tolerant, or the terrain was too rugged, or for other reasons. In general, however, most of the plant communities in California were influenced in varying degree by Indian management. California Indians did not distinguish between managed land and wild land as we do today. The word for wilderness is absent from many tribal vocabularies, as is the word for civilization. Viewed retrospectively, writes Max Olschlager in The Idea of Wilderness, the idea of wilderness represents a heightened awareness by the agrarian or Neolithic mind, as farming and herding supplanted hunting and gathering, of distinctions between humankind and nature. Interestingly, contemporary Indians often use the word wilderness as a negative label for land that has not been taken care of by humans for a long time. For example, where dense understory shrubbery or thickets of young trees block visibility and movement. A common sentiment among California Indians is that a hands-off approach to nature has promoted feral landscapes that are inhospitable to life. The white man sure ruined this country, says James Rust, a southern Sierra Miwok elder, it's turned back to wilderness. California Indians believe that when humans are gone from an area long enough, they lose the practical knowledge about correct interaction, and the plants and animals retreat spiritually from the earth or hide from humans. When intimate interaction ceases, the continuity of knowledge passed down through generations is broken, and the land becomes wilderness.
welcome back to the wild side. That was Juan and Molina with Da Agon Instinto Animal. Pardon my horrible accent. Uh, and today on the show, I am reading some excerpts from science and nature themed books that you might want to think about as Christmas presents for your family and friends, or maybe even just for yourselves. And the first one on my list was uh, one by M. Kat Anderson, and it was a little bit about uh, kind of geography and history and plants that are growing out in the wilderness of California. And now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but actually kind of still on the same theme, and talk about a book called Animal Vegetable Miracle by Barbara Kingsolver. And Kingsolver is an author that I may have referred to before on the show. I forget if I included her last year or just thought about it. But she is um, predominantly uh, a literature writer, but she does do some nonfiction as well. And all of her work has a very strong kind of naturey theme because she is trained as a biologist, and uh, she lived out in Arizona for quite a long time and then moved back to Kentucky, I think, um, certainly to the Midwest in the U.S., where she devoted quite a lot of her time for a, a year very intensively and then kind of more recreationally after that to eating uh, only food that she had grown and prepared at home or uh, had purchased locally. So she was a big part of the locavore movement and was really interested in what a person and what a family can do to kind of be green, uh, both for the environment and for the economy, but also because it has kind of beneficial health effects and it's quite good for you spiritually and you know mentally to just get out there in nature. And so she wrote about all of that in this book, which she also co-authored with her husband and daughter, who write passages kind of about uh, recipes and also the politics, but Kingsolver herself takes over the stuff that's about um, kind of the, the more naturey aspects and the crops themselves. And this bit here um, is a little bit about kind of why it is that she is so interested in this movement and why she thinks it's so important. Now it's fair to say the majority of us don't want to be farmers, pay farmers, or hear their complaints. Except as straw-chewing figures in children's books, we don't quite believe in them anymore. When we give it a thought, we mostly consider the food industry to be a thing rather than a person. We obligingly give 85 cents of our every food dollar to that thing, the processors, marketers, and transporters. And we complain about the high price of organic meats and vegetables that might send back more than three nickels per buck to the farmers. Those actual human beings putting seeds in the ground, harvesting, attending livestock births, standing in the fields at dawn, casting their shadows upon our sustenance. There seems to be some reason we don't want to compensate or think about these hardworking people. In the grocery store checkout corral, we're more likely to learn about which TV stars are secretly fornicating than to inquire as to the whereabouts of the people who grew the cucumbers and melons in our carts. This drift away from our agricultural roots is a natural consequence of migration from the land to the factory, which is as old as the Industrial Revolution. But we got ourselves uprooted entirely by a drastic reconfiguration of U.S. farming, beginning just after World War II. Our munitions plants, challenged to beat their swords into plowshares, retooled to make ammonium nitrate surpluses into chemical fertilizers instead of explosives. The next explosions were yields on Midwestern corn and soybean fields. It seemed like a good thing, but some officials saw these new surpluses as reason to dismantle New Deal policies that had helped farmers weather the economic uncertainties notorious to their vocation. Over the next decades, nudged by industry, the government rewrote the rules on commodity subsidies, so these funds did not safeguard farmers, but instead guaranteed a supply of cheap corn and soybeans. These two crops, formerly food for people and animals, became something entirely new, a standardized raw material for a new extractive industry, not so different from logging or mining. Mills and factories were designed for a multi-branched production line as complex as the one that turns iron and aluminum ores into the likes of automobiles, paper clips, and antiperspirants. But instead, this new industry made piles of corn and soybeans into high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, and thousands of other starch or oil-based chemicals. Cattle and chickens were brought in off the pasture into intensely crowded and mechanized CAFOs, also known as concentrated animal feeding operations, where corn, which is no part of a cow's natural diet, by the way, could be turned cheaply and quickly into animal flesh. 
all these different products in turn rolled on down the new industrial food pipeline to be processed into the soft drinks, burgers, and other cheap foods on which our nation now largely runs, or sits on its bottom, as the case may be. This is how 70% of all our Midwestern agricultural land shifted gradually into single crop corn or soybean farms, each one of them now, on average, the size of Manhattan. Owing to synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, genetic modification, and a conversion of farming from a naturally based to a highly mechanized production system, U.S. farmers now produce 3,900 calories per U.S. citizen per day. That is twice what we need, and 700 calories a day more than what they grew in 1980. Commodity farmers can only survive by producing their maximum meals, so they do. And here is the shocking plot twist. As the farmers produce those extra calories, the food industry figured out how to get them into the bodies of people who didn't really want to eat 700 more calories a day. That is the well-oiled machine we call late capitalism. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Florence and the Machine with Swimming. And I chose that song to introduce the next book that I'm going to read from because it is about sharks. Specifically, the dusky shark, whose name is Carcharhinus obscurus. And that uh, Latin name for this animal is, in fact, the title of the book. And the book is just the first in a series of books that focus on different species of sharks in the hopes of helping people understand that sharks are not this scary, mysterious, distant, dangerous animal that has no connection to people except maybe to periodically munch on one. These books were written by um, a fellow alum of my school, the College of William and Mary, back in the U.S. Um, and this guy actually hasn't even finished getting his degree yet, and already he's written these two books uh, and is hard at work on more of them. So the author's name is Zachary Nichols, and he's also known as Dr. Jaws. And his books pull together artwork and poetry and text to just kind of draw the reader in and use all these different types of artistic media to really connect with the animal in a different way than we might normally by just kind of reading a bit of a biography, if you like, about the shark. So he's trying to be really inventive and use different forms of science communication to really change people's opinions about these very endangered animals. So I'm first going to read the introduction to the book and then one of the first poems uh, that starts off the book. Hello friend, what you are about to read is secret. Each word, picture, and symbol has a meaning and together they will help you find something very strange but very exciting. Furthermore, each word, picture, and symbol is anchored in a living truth, but in order to fully understand what the truth is, you need to do some exploring. Beyond this little book, there is a boundless, bountiful wealth of knowledge, knowledge within your reach. You, of course, are not required to seek it, but if you do, I assure you will be rewarded with a richer understanding of our shark, the seas, and the mystery of life itself. For now, you hold in your hands a map. Let it take you from the past to the present to the weird, deep into an ocean of legends, of dark wonders, and of amber eyes. Let it take you to shark. Now the poem is called Kingdom Animalia. Look what the dawn has broken. Something new stirs in the seas, a novel language now spoken. The animals have come to be. From one tiny sponge to one funny man, a simple life will always be banned, a drama that we cannot understand. The animals, come and play, come and play. A hard-working ant meets an unfriendly beetle while two birds romance. It seems nothing's sweeter. A seahorse's dance is such a unique love. Animals, come and play, come and play. Embrace the feeling of life, a body that's one from many, a hunger that sets you right. And chase in manner uncanny your strange, sweet compassions. You animal, go and play, go and play. Now, switching gears quite a lot, I would like to read a bit from a book by an author that I have definitely discussed and quoted from here on the show in the past. Uh, and that author is Amy Stewart, who has written um, the book Wicked Plants that you might remember if you were listening in the past. I did a whole show about 
uh, many of the wicked plants that she discussed. And I have referred to the book also in other uh, shows that I've talked about plants on. And Amy Stewart is a really fun author to read because her books are really informative but also quite entertaining. They have a light tone. She's quite witty and funny. And she's written a book also about insects. I think that one specifically focused on kind of naughty insects, keeping along with that same theme of the wicked plants. Uh, and this next one that I'm going to read from is her most recent, and it's called The Drunken Botanist, The Plants That Create the World's Great Drinks. So if you have someone in your life who is a fond of different alcoholic beverages, then this might be the book for them, because it tells a little bit about um, how people came to know that these things could be used to produce these types of, of drinks, and the different ways in which these plants are manipulated to make all the different beverages that we enjoy. So um, her point here is not just to kind of, you know, capitalize on the fact that a lot of people drink, but actually to help uh, show that a lot of these things are more interesting than you might have think. And there's a lot of background and a lot of story back there that can really um, make these things worth pausing and, and thinking about a bit before you have a sip. So this passage that I'm reading is from a chapter on apples. The apple best suited for cider and brandy is what we would call a spitter a fruit so bitter and tannic that one's first instinct is to spit it out and look around for something sweet to coat the tongue. A root beer, a cupcake, anything. Imagine biting into a soft green walnut, an unripe persimmon, or a handful of pencil shavings. That's a spitter at its worst. How then did anyone discover that something as crisp as cider or as warm and smooth as calvados could be coaxed from it? The answer lies in the strange genetics of the apple tree, the DNA of apples is more complex than ours. A recent sequencing of the Golden Delicious genome uncovered 57,000 genes, more than twice as many as the 20,000 to 25,000 that humans possess. Our own genetic diversity ensures that our children will all be somewhat unique, never an exact copy of their parents, but bearing some resemblance to the rest of the family. Apples display extreme heterozygosity, meaning that they produce offspring that look nothing like their parents. Plant an apple seed, wait a few decades, and you'll get a tree bearing fruit that looks and tastes entirely different from its parent. In fact, the fruit from one seedling will be, genetically speaking, unlike any other apple ever grown, at any time, anywhere in the world. Now consider the fact that apples have been around for 50 million to 65 million years, emerging right around the time dinosaurs went extinct and primates made their first appearance. For millions of years, the trees reproduce without any human interference, combining and recombining those intricately complex genes the way a gambler rolls the dice. When primates, and later early humans, encountered a new apple tree and bit into its fruit, they never knew what they were going to get. Fortunately, our ancestors figured out that even bad apples make great liquor. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Christine Cottrell with Sitting Here Drinking. And the next book that I would like to read from here on my Christmas special of books that you might want to buy for your friends and family for the holidays is Spillover by David Quammen. And Quammen is one of my favorite authors, period, science or nature or otherwise. Uh, and I have read from him on the past in this show. I read from him last Christmas, I think, whenever I was doing my kind of first roundup of good books. But I've also talked a little bit about these topics that he writes about on the show, and I've drawn a lot of that information right from his books. And even though all of his stuff is nonfiction, uh, it reads very much like kind of a dramatic piece of fiction because he tells a really good story and completely pulls you in, makes you feel like you're there in the field with the researchers, and it's just really fascinating and quite timely stuff. Um, most of the time he tends to look at kind of uh, endangered animals or kind of unknown and unappreciated uh, scientists. And this particular book is a bit of a departure because he's not looking at kind of large charismatic megafauna, which he often does, but instead is looking at zoonoses or diseases that hop over from animals into humans. And the bit that I'm about to read is from chapter 74 in which he describes volunteering as a field hand in a place called Kulna, which is in Bangladesh. And there he is helping a team of epidemiologists as they investigate whether some of the local bats are carriers of a deadly virus known as Nipah. 
The bats were all out for their nightly feeding. We would lurk here to catch them as they returned, some time before daylight. Gopher and Pitu had already hoisted the net into place, an invisible wall of delicate mesh in the blackness somewhere above us, big as the screen for a drive-in movie. We hunkered down to wait. The night grew chilly, the first time in my limited Bangladesh experience I'd had occasion to get cold. I lay on my back upon the tar paper, bundled as best I could be in a light jacket, and went to sleep. The first bat hit the net at 4.22 a.m. Headlamps came alight, people jumped up, Gopher lowered the net on its pulleys while Epstein and P2 converged on the animal, and I staggered forward after them, safely blinded behind my safety glasses. P2 untangled the bat and Epstein accepted it, using just the technique he had described. Grabbing its head firmly, taking its legs and arms into his finger gaps, binga binga, binga binga, and then jouncing the bat into its bag. Close the bag's net, tie firmly with a piece of twine. Captured bats, like captured snakes, evidently relax better if you combine them in soft cloth. Re-raise the net and repeat. I was impressed by the proficiency of Epstein's team. Between the first bat and daylight, before call to prayer even sounded from the local mosques, they bagged five more. Six bags, six bats for, no, sorry, I can't talk tonight. Six bats for a night's work was below par for Epstein. He liked to average about ten, but it was a good start for a new location. Adjustments to the net placement, to the height of the masts, would improve the yield here in coming days. For now, enough. As dawn filtered in, we climbed down the ladder and repaired to the laboratory room. Here again, everyone had an assigned role. Mine was to stay the hell out of the way, and occasionally to assist with a swab. Three hours later, blood samples drawn, swab samples taken, tubes in the freezer tank, it was time to release the bats. Each of them first received a drink of fruit juice to help restore bodily fluids lost in the blood draw. Then we all walked back to the grassy courtyard, beneath the caroy trees, where a small crowd of men, women, and children from the neighborhood had gathered. The walls of the old depot compound were permeable to locals when something interesting was afoot. Epstein, again now wearing welder's gloves, released the first five bats one by one from their bags, holding each animal high so it wouldn't crawl up his face, letting it, letting it free its legs and its wings, then relaxing his grip gently just as the wing beats began to find purchase on air, and watching, all of us watching, the animal catch itself short of the ground, rise slowly, circle languidly, and fly away. Eventually, after a circuit or two of the compound, a few minutes of befuddled relief, it would find its way back to the communal roost, sadder but wiser, and no great harm done. Before releasing the last bat, Epstein gave a brief talk to the assembled citizens, translated by Arif, congratulating them on their good fortune as a village at harboring so many wonderful bats, which are helpful to fruit trees and other plants, and assuring them that he and his colleagues had taken great care not to harm the animals while studying their health. Then he let the final bat drop. It climbed through the air from knee level and flew away. Later he said to me, any one of those six bats could have been infected. That's what it looks like. They look totally healthy. There's no way to distinguish Nipah virus. That's why we take all these precautions. He dipped his boots again in the sterile foot bath as we left the lab and washed up at the village pump. A little girl brought soap. Now, keeping with the theme of thinking about animals that live in kind of Asian regions, I want to read a bit of an excerpt from a book called Tigers Forever, which is written by Steve Winter and Sharon Goinup. And Steve Winter also took all of the photographs in the book. And this is, um, I would say predominantly it is a photographic book, but there is also quite a lot of accompanying text that Steve wrote. And he is a uh, professional photographer for National Geographic. And over about 10 years or so, he kind of specialized, I guess, in large cat photography around the world. And these were all sorts of cats, from pumas to lepers to tigers to um, whatever species you can think of. And so it seemed quite logical to get him involved in this particular book that was funded by National Geographic and Panthera, uh, who were interested in using the book to raise awareness and also to raise money for tiger conservation. Uh, so the images are really incredible, and a lot of them are collected with camera traps, so, so they show the animals doing things you don't normally get to see tigers doing. 
Uh, and they also show a lot of the habitat and they show kind of the people that are in those tigery type regions. So it gives you a, a really good idea of, of where the tigers are living and, and what they really are like. Um, you know, not just the big scary hunters or the cute cuddly little cubs, but kind of everything in between. And so uh, this particular passage that I'm going to read talks a little bit about Steve's kind of life trying to get all of these images and how difficult it is to go out and study these sorts of animals in the wild, but also how amazing it is when you have encounters with these things. Two guards came along to protect us during setup, which was particularly dicey and grass so tall it could hide an elephant. Rigging up a camera trap takes hours. I place a camera and three flashes inside waterproof cases and then secure them to trees or posts that we pound into the ground. Here, we tried to position them where they wouldn't be kicked by rhinos or where elephants wouldn't rip them apart with their trunks. Then we wired it all to a trail master transmitter and receiver and camouflaged the equipment with foliage. Any movement that broke the transmitter's infrared beam fired the camera and the flashes. Tigers are difficult to find in that landscape, but we found signs everywhere. We saw long scrapes on the ground and deep scratches etched into trees. Some areas were thick with their musky scent. These calling cards helped the solitary cats find a mate, advertise their presence, and also mark territory. It's a way to avoid surprise encounters that could prove fatal. Their markings also pointed out prime spots for me to set up remote cameras. Trails, rocks, caves, or trees that I hoped the cats would return to. Sometimes they did. The trap where the rhino smashed our jeep captured an image of a big male standing on his hind legs, mid-scratch, looking right at the lens. Once the camera traps were up, I spent each day making safari-style loops through the park. Midday, when the light was too bright to shoot, I checked the traps, changed batteries, switched out the memory cards, and fixed damaged equipment. Downloading those images always yielded surprises. A wet elephant carrying an elephant apple, a tiger with leeches on his face, a monitor lizard, a male rhino following a female, his face bloody from mating scuffles, 50 photos of a branch that was blowing in front of the receiver, three baby sloth bears perched on their mother's back, an image of a young tiger emerging from a wall of grass, panting in a way that makes him look like he's smiling. One of my favorite places to shoot was Bahubil, a section of the park where a huge lake straddled a wide open plain. The short grass drew hundreds of hoofed animals, including big herds of deer and elephants that made it almost feel like the Serengeti. To get there, we drove through mixed landscapes. Marshes gave way to forest and an explosion of green, with great buttress trees wrapped in vines, some winding like huge serpents thick as my thigh. The trees thinned and disappeared until we wound through towering walls of golden grass. As beautiful as it was, it was always nerve-wracking. We never knew what was around the next bend. Of great concern were the charging rhinos. They're very territorial, and with their strength and heft could easily flip the jeep. Elephant herds, extremely protective of their young, and lone male elephants in must, a yearly hormonal surge, that can be dangerously aggressive. On one of those drives, Conwar rounded a bend, stopped short, and killed the engine. He whispered, Fuck! Assamese for tiger. A big male lay in the road sleeping. Just beyond, 28 elephants munched away in a field of shiny palm-leafed rattan. Three times, when the cat slipped into the grass, the herd quickly formed a protective circle around the calves, his target. The matriarch charged, trumpeting, and he returned to the road, napping until his next half-hearted attempt. It was my first real opportunity to watch a tiger up close, to really see the intricate markings on his face, his mammoth paws, his golden eyes, the reddish-amber sheen of his coat, slashed by random stripes. Two hours later, he gave up. As he walked away, I photographed him, those stripes melting into the landscape, perfectly camouflaged in the elephant grass. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Afro-Kelt Sound System with Big Cat. And that brings me to my last excerpt that I would like to read today from a book called The Book of Barely Imagined Beings, a 21st century bestiary. And this is written by Caspar Henderson. And it is a book that I was looking at in the Falmouth bookstore and thought that it looked like a really interesting and, and beautiful book. It was really well made and it was just full of of lovely images and it had kind of a, a faux uh, golden 
foil bit on the front, and it really did evoke those old bestiaries from um, hundreds of years ago that were collections of all the mysterious and interesting and uh, sacred animals that people knew of at the time. And that is what the author is kind of trying to recreate with this particular book, only in this case he's trying to kind of update it and make it relevant for modern times. And so he's looking at species that kind of um, we use to think about who we are and what we are. So these are the species against which we kind of measure ourselves or from which we learn things that help us identify who we are as human beings. And it's a really interesting concept and it's quite an engrossing book. And I'm, um, I'm not all the way through with reading, from, um, reading it actually. I've just picked this quotation out of a bit that I thought was interesting, but I'm still moving along myself, but it is quite an interesting thing where you start reading and it's quite hard to put down. So even without having finished it, I definitely recommend it. Uh, and this particular book is from, or sorry, this particular passage is from the chapter on Quetzalcoatlus. Uh, and actually I should say that each chapter is, there's one chapter per letter of the alphabet and each one of those letters is devoted to a single organism or group of organisms. And so this is Q. And Quetzalcoatlus's, Quetzalcoatlus uh, Northopi, which is the Latin name for an extinct pterosaur. Most of us will never see Earth's most magnificent creatures in person. We will never swim with a blue whale. The closest we'll get to a snow leopard at play is a few minutes of documentary film. But there is one marvel that almost all of us can see just by stepping outside. Feathered flying dinosaurs. Every swift on the wing, every treetop tree top blackbird in song, is a reminder that the descendants of these massive reptiles took to the air in flight. Humans can fly too, of course, thanks to sophisticated and heavy machines that consume huge external reserves of energy. But free flight, using our own bodies and muscle power, seems likely to remain a dream, albeit an endlessly compelling one. There have, however, been real creatures whose natural history indicates just how strange something that weighs as much as a human probably has to look in order to be capable of powered flight. These are the pterosaurs, winged lizards that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, and specifically, the greatest giants of the order, such as Quetzalcoatlus. This, great, this late Cretaceous beast was as tall as a giraffe and had the wingspan of a spitfire but probably weighed no more than a heavyweight boxer. Before picturing Quetzalcoatlus in more detail, it's worth reflecting on just how extraordinary it is for something that weighs as much as we can, uh, as we do, can fly. Humans are picayune compared to elephants or whales, but we are behemoths compared to almost every being that can fly. Most birds and bats weigh only a few grams. And being large is a huge handicap if you want to take to the air. A thought experiment suggested by Richard Dawkins shows why. Imagine a hippopotamus shrunk a thousand times so that it is about the size of a flea. Because mass shrinks by the third power, the cube, while its surface area only reduces by the second power, the square, the flea-sized hippo will weigh one billionth, a thousandth times a thousandth, its surface area. Thus, its surface area will be one thousand times as great as its full-sized cousin with respect to its weight. The happy result is that a flea-sized hippo can hitch a ride on a passing gust and float through the air with the greatest of ease. Of course, we might not notice it passing. There is a strict upper limit to how much energy animal cells can generate, and it is far below what, we what can be achieved by the combustion of high-grade aircraft fuel. This means that even the largest flying creatures tend to be surprisingly light. The world's biggest flying animal, mammal, for example, is the golden-capped fruit bat, also known as the giant golden-crowned flying fox. This gentle fig-eating beast, which lives in remote forests in the Philippines, has a wingspan of about a meter and a half, or five feet, about five-sixths of the length of the outstretched human arm. But it weighs just 1.2 kilos, or three pounds. That's not much of a meal once the wings and bones are removed, but these bats are prized for their taste and have been hunted to the verge of extinction. Once, on a small island far from the main Philippine archipelago, I met a 17-year-old crack shot called Stalin, famed for supplying city restaurants with these bats. Everyone said Stalin's marksmanship would earn him a place as a sniper with the U.S. Army in Iraq, and so it proved. The most massive flying bird still in existence is probably the Great Bustard. 
Once common in grasslands from Mongolia to Spain, bustards are now vulnerable to extinction thanks to the conversion of the grasslands that they like into farmland and their tendency to fly into electric power lines at high speed. Adult males can have a wingspan of 2.4 meters or 8 feet and weigh around 12 kilos or 26 pounds, but have supposedly been recorded at up to 21 kilos or 46 pounds or roughly the weight of a five-year-old child. In the breeding season, having no chins, they grow splendid feathery beards on their necks, like Victorian gentlemen gone slightly awry. And that is the last little bit that I would like to read to you today. I hope you found something in there that you maybe are interested in tracking down and reading for yourself. I will put all of these books and their authors up on the Wildside webpage so that you can uh, find them again if you would like to follow them up and, and maybe buy or check them out at the library. Um, and one last thing I will tell you is that also every year the Royal Society gives out something called the Winton Prize. And um, I will put a link on the website to this year's nominees for the Winton Prize as well as the actual winner who is someone who wrote about uh, the search for the Higgs boson particle. So all of these things will be on the website if you want to track them down. And that is all from me for this week. I will talk to you next week.